Okay, well, hopefully everybody who is going to join has joined now. We're going to make a start on this webinar. First of all, welcome to everybody to this uh, latest in our MRDCL Masterclass series. Uh, this is the fourth in our 2020 series. And today is sort of something as a, spe a specialist subject, I guess, um, the reading data from two or more uh, different data files or sources. And uh, the reason we actually ran a webinar on this is I think because it's something that we've seen in support where we've seen more and more questions about how do I read from one or more uh, to more than one uh, data file. And I think there's some different reasons for that. Um, the, probably the two main reasons I've seen are that sometimes when you're exporting data from online software, for example, it may have a maximum number of uh, fields that it can output in one in one uh, export and so you have to do if it's a big project you have to do two exports and so you end up with two files sort of file one and file two uh, which has all the respondent data across those two files so record number one sits at the top of one file and top of the other and behind that is two and three and so on um, so that's one reason and the other the other reason I, that I, I see anyway from what we what we get from our support desk is that more and more people are doing surveys from samples of customers for example so one that springs to mind is where someone had a, uh, a, a customer base of uh, I can't remember how many but let's say it's a hundred thousand customers and a survey was conducted amongst two thousand of those so we've got two thousand respondent uh, records here from, from a survey that uh, you've conducted and here we've got information about maybe 200,000 customers and you want to link them the data where relevant uh, for the people surveyed uh, to their the, the, the customer data that your client probably has about them so that you can do some analysis that has been pulled effectively from a database. So they're probably two of the reasons, there may be others, um, but they're probably two of the things and we've seen a, a noticeable increase in the number of support calls we've been getting about that sort of thing. So first of all, just to tell you what you're going to see today, this is very much uh, a demonstration with script, so it's very much into heavy MRDCL scripting. Um, just what you're not going to see first of all. So what we're not covering in this session today is two things particularly. We're not covering hierarchical data, we're not covering hierarchical data where each level of the data is a separate line in a data file. So there are uh, files that, 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 that people have from time to time where perhaps you're doing a doctor and patient survey. So each line in the file will be a doctor with perhaps a code one on it and then a, a series or several patient records with a two on them, perhaps a code two. Um, and they're linked together, but they come in as separate lines of data in your data file. I'm afraid we're not doing that one today and we also have uh, occasions where people want to read data for, where you've got to run a survey you've got your survey data but they also want to read data from a second data file that's in Excel or Access um, and we're not covering that today I'm afraid now both those topics are covered in videos actually that are available on our website um, but we're not doing those today so what are we doing today so let's have a look at what we're doing what we're doing we're looking at five different scenarios today and looking at how to process them because although on the surface these things are quite simple it does require some fairly good understanding of the commands that are available in MRDCL to be able to carry out all five of these tasks and I'll go through what they are in just a second but there's not many commands to to understand but they're quite complex to use and need clarity if you like in understanding what they mean and personally when I've ever set up any complicated um, uh, re reading from more than one, more than one file uh, it does take some it takes some effort sometimes to get it working exactly right because there are some tricks that you need to learn so we're going to look at first of all a really simple example where the, there's a one-to-one -one relationship so what I mean by that is you maybe have a data file with a hundred respondents in one file and the same hundred respondents in another file and you want to match them up basically and pull their two sources of data together so that you can process it as one block of data for each respondent so that's the easiest one to deal with and we'll be doing that 
straight after I go through this introduction. The second one is where you've got one to many. So that's more like the example that I gave uh, when I was introducing this section where you've surveyed maybe 2000 customers, but there's a database over here of 200,000 customers. And for the 2000 respondents that you've carried, that you've conducted research on in your survey, you want to pull some data from another file. So all the records that are in file one are in file two, but file two will have records that have not been used in file one. Then we come to the third scenario, uh, which actually in terms of MRDCL is processed quite differently or fairly differently where you want to do the other way round, where you want to uh, want many to one. So you want every record in the 200,000 database, which was my file two just now, and some of them will have some data in the other file, but not all of them. Next scenario we're going to look at is where the data is not sorted. Now, a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you today relies on your data being in sequential order. Uh, it makes things much easier when data files are in sequential order because you know that if there's a record missing from the other file and you can't find a matching serial number, you know it hasn't got a record in the other file, so you can carry on processing. When, you don't, when you've got an unsorted file, there's no, nothing you can do except start at the top every time and find the matching record. So if I've got a survey uh, where the, the record numbers are random or the customer IDs are in a random order and a database over here that's numbered one up to 100,000, shall we say, the only way I can match that up is by searching each time and looking for the matching record in my survey data if they're in, running in, in, a, in a random order. We'll be looking at that. And finally, we're looking at totally asynchronous files. That's where anything goes basically. So there's a many to many relationship, some people call that, um, in that anything can happen. So a record might be in this file and in this file, or it might just be in the first file and not the second, or it might be in the second and not the first. Um, so we're gonna deal with that. All right, so that's enough of the introductions. I'm now gonna take you out of PowerPoint, I hope, and I'm gonna take you into the scripts. So the first thing we were gonna look at was uh, surveys where there's a matching record, where there is a one-to-one -one relationship. So for every record in file one, there's a record in file two. So just to bring that to life, here we go. I've got a small survey here. Assume the record number is in the first three fields. So we've got records 001 to 010, so one to 10 in file one. If I open up my uh, file two here now, you'll see I've got the same 10 records. They happen to have the same number of fields, but they could have different numbers of fields. That uh, perhaps is something I should, should have made clearer in the file. So one file could have just 20 fields, the other could have 5,000 fields, and that would be absolutely fine. So let's look at uh, working with that uh, data. So I'm going to open up a run file called one to onestp and as usual, all these scripts will be available after the webinar with, of course, uh, a recording of this webinar. So let's open up one to onestp and look at what it's got in it and just go through it line by line. When you've got more than one data file that you want to open, you refer to them as two streams, A and B, and if you've got uh, three or four, you go C and D. So I'm saying that my first data file, my stream A, is in file one.ask, and my second stream is in file two.ask. So they were the two files that you saw just now. Finish control, start data, nothing unusual here. Serial number in columns one to three. Now, each of those records was actually only six uh, columns long or so six fields in length. Um, but I've allowed here for each of them to be a hundred, even though they only go up to six. So as long as it's more than six, it's fine. Now, you'll note that what I've done here is I've set to, because I'm allowing a hundred columns or fields for each data file, I've allowed the length of my record to be double what I've actually allowing for. In fact, I only needed six here, but I'm allowing 100 for each file. And all that I'm doing here is I'm saying, read a record in from the A file. So read a line in from file one 
and store it in 1 to 100, read a line in from file B and store that in 101 to 200. So you can see why now I've allocated 200 uh, columns in my card character statement because what I'm reading from the first file I'm putting in 1 to 100 and what I'm putting in the second file I'm putting in 101 to 200 and you'll have to remember that that's where you stored your data you can store it anywhere you, you like you could store it around the other way if it was more logical to you for some reason I've chosen to store the, the data in file 1 in 1 to 100 and in file 2 in 101 to 200 and then what I'm doing is I'm listing what's in 4 to 6 and what's in 104 to 106. So in other words, I'm listing the fourth to six fields in the first data file and what are effectively the fourth to six fields in the second data file. So let's just remind ourselves of the date of the um, uh, of the uh, data files here. So we've got file one here. So record number one goes one, two, three, two, 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 one, 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 and one, one, one in four to six. If we switch to file two down here, you can see they go four, 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 five, 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 six, 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 four, four, four. Let's see if we can remember that. All right, so let's close this and let's run it. And if we look in my report file, we should see that these two data files have been merged together. So you can see that record one is one, two, three in four to six and four, four, four in four to six of the second file and two, two, two for the second record and five, 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 one, one, one and six, six, six. So that all appears to be working well, just to remind you, one, two, three, two, 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 one, one, one and four, 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 five, 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 six, six, six. Sure enough, that all seems to match up. So that would appear that I've successfully read my data into uh, as one, if you like, now, so that I've actually got one record for each respondent, pulling it one for one from two different files. And of course, I could go in here now and write some variables. I just need to be aware that if I'm reading some data from file one, it's in one to 100. If I'm reading from file two, it's in 101 to 200. So I could say now ds dollar age is 104 one two or whatever it might be and that would mean 104 that I'm talking about the fourth column or the fourth field in the second data file and this is something I won't repeat for the other uh, examples which are more complicated uh, hopefully that I've made that clear enough here now in, in terms of how it's all working now you don't if you're 100% confident that your data files exactly match you can just proceed with that. But there is a problem with this if there's anything wrong with your data. For example, if record five was missing for some reason, maybe the software outputting the record had made a mistake or didn't output empty records or something like that, who can say what the reasons are. But if that record five was missing, so let's take it out now, this would produce absolute nonsense because what it would do it would read one two three four one for one but when it got here it would have a problem because it would read record five from file one and record six from file two because there's no control it's just reading another line so that read a and read b is just reading another line in the file it doesn't care what it is it's just reading the next line you would get some error message at the bottom here to say that this file would run out with after reading nine records because there wouldn't be another card or another line to read when we got down here. But nonetheless, that might be easy to miss and you would produce possibly there uh, incorrect data. So as a as good practice, I always recommend that if you're doing this, even if you're 100 percent confident um, that your data is absolutely perfectly matching, I would always put in a message here at the bottom which says something like this where I'm checking I'm saying if 1 to 3 is not equal to 101 to 103 edit list something has gone wrong so that I can check and uh, make sure that uh, I know about it before I go on and process the data and start running tables so there I'm checking that the first to third field in file one matches the first to third field 
in the other file. And indeed, if the record number is in a different field in different files, you can still match using that uh, technique there as well, although you would probably then remove the serial number statement as it could check something wrongly, an error record. All right, so that's the first example and a fairly straightforward one. Um, let's move on now to the next example where things do get much more complicated and indeed all the rest of the examples are much more complicated and we'll be learning some new techniques or different techniques when we come to this. So this is a one to many now so if we look at the files here I've got five records in here 1, 5, 11, 19 and 20 whereas in my file 2 I've got all 20 records. You can see it starts at one, it runs right down to 20. So this is what I call a one-to-many file. Um, um, it does have other meanings in databases. Sometimes it means that one-to-many in databases where it, it can mean that there's multiple uh, records. So it might be buying occasions. So that if I bought five things, I could have five records. In, in my examples here, I'm talking about Every respondent uh, is in one is is in both is, is in both files. Sorry, every every respondent in file one is in file two, but the reverse is not necessarily true. Um, so we need a way now if we want to match this data, and you can see what I've done. I've just made record number one. It's all ones. For two, it's all two. It's all threes, and then when I get to record ten, it goes ten, ten, ten. So it's easy to remember this data this time. If we look at the other file, um, it's got some random data in four to six. So um, we'll have to try and remember that. One, two, three, two, 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 one, 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 two, 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 and one, two, one. Now, this is my survey data here. So what I want to do is actually work with these five records and pull the data from the other file uh, for the record that matches. Now, I can't use the technique I used in my first example because the first one would be fine but then it would try and match record number five with record number two in the second file if it just read the next one down and record number 11 with record number three and number 19 with number four. That would be no good at all. So we need a way to just read through the uh, second file to make sure I've got the matching record. And that requires a much more complex script to do that. So let's look at one-to-many.stp and see what we've got to do to achieve that. Now this time uh, there's a lot more control coming into reading my data and reacting to it depending on what happens. So we've got a, an at top statement here. Um, I don't know if that's actually used. I think I've done that in development. I don't think I used that in the end, but it's, it's so it's redundant. But the first thing I'm doing is I'm reading a record in one to a hundred just as before so the same at the top here, CA and CB, nothing different there. But I'm reading a record from the A file, the first file, file one, my one with five records in. And I'm also storing the serial number in one to three. So I, I, own, I want to process all the records in A and find the matching record in B. Now what I've got to do in file B is keep reading records until I find the matching serial number. So to remind you what we got in file one, it, as it happens with record one, I will pull the first record from file two, but then I've got to skip two, three, four when I come to process record number five. So I need a mechanism to not read, not actually read a record or not do anything with it if it's not the record I want. So at read B is a statement to tell it where to go to in a minute. And you can see I've got to go back to this in a minute, but let's come to that in a second. I'm going to start I'm going to do the same principles before. I'm going to hold um, the, the data in file one in one to 100 and the data in file two in 101 to 200. So same as the first example. And indeed, I'm going to read from the second file and store it in 101 to 200. Now, the only thing I'm doing additionally here is I'm clearing out 101 to 200 just in case there's any data left in there from the previous record because what I'm going to do here is I'm going to keep going round and round reading from the second file until I get a matching serial number and I don't want to be picking up any data from the previous record. So I'm going to read into here um, a line from the second file. 
I'm defining serial two as being the serial number in the first three columns again. So the same principle there. If the serial number in the first file is equal to the serial number in the second file, I'm going to OK. So if it, if it matches, I'm carrying on here. And you can see I'm going to list out what's in four to nine in both the file one and the file two. If it's greater than the serial number, I'm going to say, OK, that record's not found. Uh, and I'm putting a message out to my file. I'm going to clear the contents and I'm going to go to OK. So it's going to uh, if, it's, if it misses it, it's going to go to OK. But if it's going to if it needs to just read another one so that it catches up, as it were, with the serial numbers that I want, I'm going to go back to read and try and read another one. So that's my sort of list of options. So if it's still less than, in other words, I'm covering all eventualities here, equal, greater than. So by implication, I could put if less than on here. Um, if it's less than, I want to go back and uh, read another one. And then I'm going to list out to make sure that what I've done is correct. Now, I think there's a, some good tips here. Once you start getting things getting a bit more complicated, it's very easy to get your logic wrong in, wrong in here. And I always recommend that if you get if, if you set up something like this and you have problems debugging while it's not working, the number of records written is wrong. Start using list statements to debug what you're doing. So maybe you're not reading anything in from file B. You've forgotten to put a line of code in or you forgot to put that go to read B back in there so that people just carried on falling through the script. Um, if you put a list statement here or a list statement up here, you quickly start to find out what it is that um, is not working in your scripts. So do use list statements for debugging. They really are helpful. So now we're listing out four to nine from uh, both um, files. And let's see how that works. So let's leave the data files open. Let's run it. And just a quick check there. You can see it's read 25 lines in total, which I looks correct to me. It's read five from one file and 20 from the other. So there we go. That's would, always worth getting checking this when you're debugging these things and running for the first time. Check that it hasn't uh, stopped reading a file. And there's a reason for that, which I'll just come back to in a minute. So we've got five lines here, 20 lines. And I've got five records on my IDF, which is what I would expect. If I look at my listing, it looks as though it's worked to me. So it's picked out record number one. And remember record number one had all ones here. Record number five had 222, all fives here for record number five. Record number 11 had 111, all ones here. And 19 had 19, 19, 19, and so on. It looks as though it's worked to me. Now, one thing I was gonna add here, which I talked about uh, why you should check the number of records that are coming out in the log at the screen is if you hit the bottom of any of these files by default it will just go to finish data and complete the run so if we hit the bottom of this file because we had an error um, before it had finished reading all the records in the a file you would just carry on through finished data and you wouldn't read any more records from file a so it's always a good idea when you're preparing these things and testing it for the first time that you know how many records there are in each file and you get in the habit of checking that you've got what you expect, five in there, 20 in there, and five records written away, which is what I expected. And now I know with a good chance that everything I've done is correct. And by listing out some data here, I can be confident going ahead that everything I've, I've uh, tried to achieve, I've succeeded in. All right, so that's one to many. Now, one of the things that can make these things go wrong and is highly dependent, because it's always reading on to the next record if it's not the right match, it does depend on the serial numbers being in sequential order. And whilst you might be 99% of your records being in sequential order, I think it's a good idea, particularly on a very big file, to be 100% certain. So I tend to get in the habit of constructing a little file like this. Um, let's just find that in my folder here. 
which which is called ismyfileok.stp, which again we'll send out. Uh, and if we look inside that, what this does is it checks that the serial numbers are either sequential, if you expect them to be sequential, or that they're always getting bigger so that there's no um, uh, serial numbers that are out of order because that will cause a problem in our script that we've got at the moment. If records are out of order, um, you would start to hit problems because it would try to match up, say it jumped to record 999 after record four and three, a uh, record, it was looking for record five. If it hit 999, it wouldn't know what to do. It wouldn't recover from that necessarily very well um, because um, it would, that record 999 would have gone. And when it come to 999 in file one, it wouldn't know anything about it. So it is a good idea to check that your files are sequential. And so this little script here, um, is a clever script that never lets the record or reads from just file two. So I'm just checking file two's in sequential order. And what it does is it reads a line from the file and it's putting it into one to a hundred this time. And you'll see go to top. So it never gets out of this loop here. So in fact, it's sort of trapped in this loop. And the only time it gets out is when e file equals done. So only when it hits the end of the file, e file means end of file, does it get out of here. It just goes round and round here. So whereas normally when you read data in MRDCL, you have start data and finish data uh, and it just falls through each time for each record. Here we're stopping it getting out the bottom. Go to top just says go back and read another one. Go back and read another one. Go back and read another one. So it never escapes from here. Because of that, I'm able to store the previous serial number. So I'm starting with a serial number of zero. I pick up this serial number, which we know is number one. I find the difference between this serial number and the last one, which you'd expect to be one. So if every record is, is it should be present, you would want this line of code. So this checks the difference between the record we're reading now and the previous one is one. And if it's not, it will give me a message saying this record is missing. And this one here expects the difference to be less, sorry, expects the difference to be uh, greater than zero. And so if the last record is less than the, the, the record I'm reading now, I get, a, I get a record out of order message. So let's just see that running. So there we go, no error messages at all. Let's quickly edit this. Let's first of all, uh, re leave out record number 10 and run it. Oh, I need to, I think probably switch my commenting. And this now tells me there's a missing record. I've got record number 11 and the last one was number nine. So it's depicting it's picked out here rather that number 10 is missing by by definition and if we had a had one out of order uh, let's just open up my file two again let's repair this and let's just put one out of order here let's call this one 999 so the records are out of order and change the check so take out that one where they should be every record number present and now we get uh, 007 there's a record out of order and we can go back and find that i could have put a message out saying it was 999 a bit, a bit more useful um, but as you can see it's it's picked up that error for me and i can fix my data before i go any further in the process so that's just a free routine that i think is quite useful and something that i always use if i'm uh, expecting data to be in sequential order because if the files come from your client and it's not quite in sequential order there's some something anomalous about it uh, you'd be in trouble all right so that's um, um, our second example now we're going to read that same data the other way around so we're going to this time uh, do all the records with some of them being surveyed so it's the same data but we're going to read this as the master effectively and where there's data in here we're going to note the fact we've got some survey data so now we're going to 
change what we're doing. So the process is somewhat reversed here. So now my A file is file two and my B file is file one. I don't need to have done that. I could have left them as A and B and then reverse my read B and my read A around the other way. Um, that's your choice, obviously. And what I'm attempting to do here is to, first of all, set a variable that tells me whether I've got a matching record in both files. So file two, a.ask, has got 20 records. File one's got five that match, or five records of those 20. The other 15 haven't. So I'm starting by setting a variable called match true and false. So that's set to true and false. I'm at the top here and I'm gonna read from the A file. Now you can already see I'm using that E field statement there um, because I don't want to let people out of this loop. I'm going back to top every time. So I don't want to let them out of here. They're gonna go round and round this here and never escape from this code and hit finish data, except when I run out of records in the A file, which is file two dot ask in this, in this particular example. Then I'm going to say, well, if I've got a match, I want to read the next record from file B. So this is a new command we haven't actually looked at yet. Now, read next is a really useful tool when you've got complex data sets. What read next means, means have a little look at the next record that's coming up, but don't actually read it. Now, a read statement reads a line from a file such that you can't go back and read it again. So once you've read it, you've read it, you can't say, well, actually put that back. It's not like um, two piles of playing cards where you're taking one off each pile and you could put one of the cards back on the pile. Once you've read a line uh, in MRDCL, you can't read from that file again. It's ready to go on to the next one. You can read the next one, but you can't go back. Um, so what you have is this tool called read next which lets you sort of look at, look ahead without actually reading it. So it's like sort of having a little glance over there and seeing, okay, I can have a quick look at what you've got without actually uh, reading the, 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 the record in. I fixed this to match equals one for the first record so that it works. I need, when I start, when I come through this at the very beginning of the process, um, I've set it to true here because I always want to start by looking at the other file to see whether I've got a match. So if I didn't have that on there, if I didn't, uh, uh, it, it, would, it would read it anyway. But once I get down here, I only want to read from the other file if we're matching. So let's see how that manifests itself. So as soon as I get in here, um, I want to set it back to false. So false, true. So I turn it back off. So the second answer is now true. And I'm going to take different actions depending on whether um, uh, the, the serial number in each file matched or not. So if the serial number in the first file was the same as the serial number that I looked ahead to, and sorry, I should have said here, I've allowed 300 fields now and I'm reading the next into 201 to 300. So I'm reading from file A in one to 100, file B I'm gonna use 101 to 200 and the, re the read next where I'm cheating and looking ahead, I'm putting in 21 to 300. So if the serial number of the record in, fi in file A is equal to the next one in file B, I actually want to read B. So if it is a match, I actually want to read it. And I'm going to read it into 101 to 200 as before. I'm going to switch match on. And I'm going to go to OK and end if. So it's going to go down here having set the variable match to true. Or to the first bit. Yes, in other words. If it's not equal for any reason, I don't want to read the record from file B because it doesn't match. I want to leave the what I've got in B at the moment. I'm going to set match to the second code, which means false. Go to OK and end if. So when I get here, the variable match will know whether there's a match or not. Then I'm going to feel, define the field from four to five or data field one from four to five in the first file, data field two, 
as four to five in the first file, in the second file, I apologize. And I'm gonna write that away. Now I need to write that away because if I just go to top every time, it'll never write anything away because otherwise only finished data writes a record away unless you've got a write statement. So I need a write statement there. Then I can go back to top and I read another one from the A file. Now I only need to read another one from the B file if there wasn't a match last time. If there is a match, um, I want, sorry, if there is a match, I want to read another one or look ahead at the next one to see what's coming up next because I've read another one here. If there wasn't a match, what I've got already is absolutely fine to compare. So I don't need to read B again. So I've got my matches, I've got my read under control here. And indeed this time I've done some tables. I've done a table on the 100 serial numbers or up to 100 serial numbers that we've got in here. I've done a table on what's in data field one, um, which is what's in four to five. And then I've said, if matches are one, I want a table of what's in data field two. And you can see I've analyzed this by match. So let's have a look. Let's run that and have a look at the table. Whoops, let's look at the tables we're getting. And there we go. So this looks quite good to me. Again, I should check my log. I'm not gonna do that here to save a little bit of time. Uh, you can see I've got five records that got matched, 15 that didn't. Here's their serial numbers. They're the serial numbers that matched, one, five, 11, 19, and 20. There's the ones that didn't match. And when I come down here, um, the data that was in field one, two records had 11 and so on. They're the ones that matched. And there's the data that we had for the ones that didn't match. And then finally, we've got data field two for the five records that match. And of course that's filtered on match. So that column has come out empty. So it looks as though um, everything is working fine there to me. And we've got everything in place as we need. And again, I can't stress enough that when you're preparing this, um, if you didn't have that, you would, you would get an error. If you didn't go back to top, you would have a problem. Uh, you would just hit the end of file of one of those files and that would be all it would read. And as I said before, it's really good practice to get in the habit when you're testing these things out, just to make sure that you're reading what you would expect. So 20 lines from here, five lines from this file, uh, and you've written away 20 records and we've got three pages of tables. So it's, it's worth checking all that absolutely thoroughly because if you don't, um, it might look as though it's working first of all, and then you might add some more data and without realizing it, it's not working quite as you expect. All right, so that's three examples that we've, we've got through here now. Now the fourth example is where we have one to many. So like the second example, but the data in the second file has come in a completely uh, random order. Uh, so let's look at that. I uh, just need to open up that folder again. I think I closed it. So let's look at the files this time. So my file one this time has got the same five respondents, one, five, 11, 19, and 20. But this time, my file two has come in a completely random order. So you can see it's got three, one, eight, they're all in there, all the records that I want, but they've just come to me in a random order. Now you'll see what I've done here is that I've put in an extra line at the bottom of this file. Um, there are ways of getting around this, but you just make the programming so much more difficult. I would always recommend following this if you've got something like this, where you've got a data file in a random order, put in an extra line at the bottom manually, which has something that's bound to be unique. You can see I've put ZZZ as a line of data. And the reason I do that is it's same thing as I've talked about already, that you don't want to hit the bottom of the file because then MRDCL will go to finish data and close the data stage for you effectively 
immediately. So we don't want it to hit the bottom of the file. So what I can do in my script is say, well, if I get to ZZZ, I know I've hit the bottom of the file, so I need to go back to the top. And that's the whole way that this is going to have to work, that when we're reading a record from file one, we're going to have to scan through all this data to find it. Um, now, I can't pretend when you've got big data files, this can really slow down your reading substantially. It won't notice here because I've got one file of five records and one file of 20 records. If I had a file of um, a thousand records and a hundred thousand records here, think of the number of lines it's going to be reading. On average, a record to match is going to be in the middle of the file, let's say. So it's going to read half this file as many times as there are records in the first file. Now, in this particular case, we've got 20 records here. So on average, it's got to read just 10 records on average to find its match. We're only reading five records in our file one. So it's only got to read the equivalent of 50 records, which is not particularly onerous. However, if this was 100,000 records, for each record in your first file, it would average reading 50,000 records to find the match. So if you've got a sample of 1,000 and, 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 and uh, 10,000 here, it will be 5,000 times 1,000 lines it would have to read from this file. And that would mean it's reading 5 million records. If the files are even bigger than that, it would multiply up even further. So do bear that in mind. It isn't desirable to have files that are unsorted. However, you can deal with them in MRDCL. Um, let's look at how we deal with those. One to many unsorted. Um, so we read from file one and we read from file two. We've got the same principle here. I'm at the top. Uh, this time the A is the, the smaller file with five records. This is one to many again. And the B is file two. I'm reading a record from A. I'm defining its serial number. Uh, sorry, an integer from its serial number. And then I'm setting a variable here called found and not found. So I start with it being switched off and set it accordingly as I go along. Now, what I'm using here is another command that's available in MRDCL, which is called rewind. So what rewind means is it's going to go back to the top and start searching for your matching record every time. So it's going to read a record from file A. So that's quite easy this time. It's going to read a record here. And then it's just going to keep reading through file B until it finds a matching record. So actually, the script is a lot easier. The processing is a lot heavier. So I read from file B. I read it into 1 to 200. You'll note I've got that command in there. I'm saying if 101 to 103 is ZZZ, I'm then setting found to uh, the second code, the not found code, and I'm going to OK. So if I can't find a match in here at all, I'm accepting is a valid record and processing it, but I'm setting the variable found to the second code, which means not found, and I'm continuing processing. Otherwise, if a record wasn't in the bigger file, again, we'd go to finish data and we would end our run. So it's important that we have that in there, that control to send it back. If I get a matching record, I then can just say, well, I found it, set found true false, go to OK and process it. For any other reason, I just want to go and read another record. So when I'm trying to match up this data here, so let's go back to our file here. So it'll open up here. It'll read one. Well, as it happens, it'll find it won't find one as the first file as the first record this time. In this particular case, it's going to read that line. It's not going to match. It's going to read that line. It will match. So it's lucky it's found its second and it will go and process it because that's what we said as soon as they match we process it. Then when it comes to the next record in this file, which is number five, the rewind will take it back to the top. And this time it's not quite so lucky. It's got to go all the way down to here to find the match and it will process it. Then it's going to do number 11, which is got to go right to the bottom of the file to find 
and so on. So you can see there's a lot more processing going on here uh, to find the record. Actually, the script is much more straightforward. So for any other reason, we want to go back and read another one. So the two things that are sort of different, if there's a matching record, we carry on. If we hit ZZZ, we give up effectively. Any other reason, we go back and try and find another one. And then I'm just listing it out again. And you can see I've defined a variable here called uh, column 10, which is picking up column 10 from the uh, second file so that we can do a cross tab of that. So let's run it and see if it works. And it looks as though it's been pretty good here. And sure enough, it's found records 1, 5, 11, 19, and 20, and they all seem to have code three in that particular field. So it's found my records that I expected to match up, and it's found the uh, codes that were in the file too. So that's coping with that scenario. The fifth and final scenario that we're going to uh, look at is where the files are asynchronous and by that I mean that pretty much anything goes in the sense that what we've got here is we've got records one two three four and ten in this file but in the other file we have records one four five six seven eight nine and ten um, so it's got some of that are in some files and some that are not in the other but so it'll take either way around and we could put a number 11 in here if you like and it should work fine, or even a 23. So they're completely asynchronous. What is in one file may or not be in the other, effectively. All right, so let's look at processing this now. Uh, they are sorted in order this time, so there's no rewinding involved. If they weren't, you'd need to use the rewind facility, but as I say, I would be careful with that. And what I'm doing here, I'm using the same principles as before, except what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look at the next in each file so I can decide what to do. So I'm starting by making action a one. So you can see the variable action here is a match, a file one only record, a file two only record. I start by saying that I want the action to be one. And the only reason for doing that is that that tells the code down here to go and read another record from uh, the file. So when action has a value of one and two, it looks at the next record, read next, and puts it into 201 to 300 from the A file. And if it's one or three, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail in a minute, I want to peek ahead to the next record in the B file, and I'm going to store that in 301 to 400. So this time I'm using 1 to 100 to really store the data uh, when I read it from file 1, 101 to 200 for file 2, so same as before, 201 to 300 to look ahead and look at what's in file A, and 301 to 400 to look ahead and see what's in file B. Now one thing with read next, it would be nice but it doesn't work, if you put multiple read next in, it will just keep reading the next one over and over again. Read next doesn't mean read next, have a look at the read next, another read next doesn't mean look at the one after that and the one after that and the one after that. It will just keep reading the next one. So you can't read further ahead. But I don't think I've ever seen a situation when you've needed to do that, but I have seen people try to say read next, read next, read next and think they're reading three records ahead. Now you can see uh, what I'm doing here is I'm covering all eventualities. So I'm covering what happens when I look ahead and the two serial numbers are equal, less than or greater than. If they're equal, I'm saying that action is B.1, so it's a match. So if what's in the, uh, the ne if the next line in the A file matches the next line in the B file, I'm saying action is set to one, which means it's a match. I actually read what's in that A file and I read what's in that B file and I go to process and process, as you can see, is down here and it's doing some stuff like before. If it's less than, 
what I want to do is set action to two. So two means it's in file one only. So if it's less than, I only want to read the A file. I don't want to read the B file at this stage. And then I go to process and I process down here. But I know when action is set to value two, that it's only got a record in file one, not in file two. And the reverse of that is true here, that if it's greater than, it means there's a record in file two, but not in greater here. And so I read from file B in 101 to 200, and I go and process that. So where they match, I read from both files. Where one's less than the other, I read just from the A, and here I just read from the B. And then I can process and define variables down here. Make sure I've got a write command because when I've got a write command, I'm going to then go back up to read A because I'm not going to let them out the bottom until I finish uh, both files. So here we go. I go back to read A and you'll see now what I do is I decide whether to read the next one again depending what happened on the last record. So if the last record had read a line in, I want to read next again. If it didn't, what I had in 201 to 300 for the previous read next is fine. So based on the action, it decides whether I want to read another cut or look at reading another record from the first file. If it was a three, in other words, so if it was a, a match on file two only, I don't need to read ahead again because I already know what the next one is and I'll be looking for another match or to see whether it becomes greater than or less than to start processing that. This logic takes some getting used to and it needs some practice and I almost guarantee when you do it for the first time, you'll get something wrong and it's hard to debug. Do use list statements. I can't stress enough. When I, when I created this one, I didn't get it right first time. I used list statements to show me what, what it thought it was reading at any one time to help me debug it. So putting in list statements, perhaps here to see what's in 201 to 202 to 300 and so on, can help you debug what it's, what it's failing to do because what it's easy to do is get your logic wrong so that you don't wrap back to the right place and you, or you read a line too many and you get out of synchronization. It's really important that you do your debugging with these types of exercises. And now sure enough, when I run this, uh, it's gonna give me a table. Um, it's got my serial numbers in here and my records that are matching in each file. So you can see the records that are matching. They're the three that match. They're the two that uh, match on file one only. And they're the ones that match in file two only. And we've got some tables that go off from, from that where we're filtering on um, those in file two and so on and doing some other analysis. You can all look at that if you wish to when you, when you see the files. They're pretty straightforward tables. But the important thing in here is making sure that you write records away for yourself because they're not going to finish through finished data otherwise. Um, so make sure you've got your write statements and you send people back to the right place and choose what you read and you don't try and read next too many times because it won't do what necessarily you think it's uh, supposed to be doing. So there we are. Um, I've covered five different scenarios there. That's not every scenario. Um, I find with these things that as soon as you look at these things, you'll find something else. You'll find somebody who's perhaps got one to, to many uh, where there's multiple in the other file. That needs another level of skill to keep reading that file and seeing whether they're still matching. I can't cover every permutation in a session that's going to be under an hour. So at that point, I am going to stop. Um, I also should say that you can read up to four files in this method your logic just gets harder and harder once you start reading from three files simultaneously. Um, you have to again cope with all the different permutations that are A possible and B that you know about. I do think when you get into really complex relationships where there's three or four files it is worth 
running some 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 diagnostics first just to check your data files are in sequential order for example and you know what you've got um, because you can save yourself a lot of time later um, and finding it, uh, bugs are difficult to find if you assume data is perhaps correct when it might not be so with that i'm going to stop um, I should have said at the beginning, there's a Q&A panel that you can type any questions you have. So sorry for not saying that at the beginning. Um, hopefully you're all familiar with that already. So if any of you had any questions, you would have typed them already. Um, Lauren is on the call, I hope. And if there are any questions, um, I'll be happy to try and field those as they come in now. If you've got any questions now, please type them in fairly quickly and uh, we'll try and answer them uh, before the end of the session. Yeah, so well, yeah, um, just one, um, yeah. which you kind of just covered there. Um, okay. It's just how how difficult is it to have three files? Uh, uh, more difficult. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, the answer to that is yeah, you obviously start by saying C bracket C equals file three dot ask. But again, it's just, I mean, I'm using this one here, which is probably one of the more complicated ones. It, it's about following all the permutations that can happen. So if it was like this, where they were all asynchronous, for example, I would have a read C here. I would then have, rather than three actions, there would be six actions, I think, where I think I'm right in saying, so they could be in just in file one, just in file two, just in file three, seven actions. Um, or they could be in one and two, one and three, and two and three, or they could be in all three. So you would need seven actions to deal with that, and you would respond accordingly. But actually, it wouldn't be that much more difficult than this. It is a bit more difficult. I mean, where things get really difficult with three files, I certainly find it difficult. It, it, it can take me two or three hours to get something working correctly, um, is where perhaps you've got file one, which is your survey data, file two, where everybody where, where there's a perhaps all your customer base in there and file three has got transactions by the survey data so that one may or may not have one or more uh, transactions in there so you might have five respondents in file one uh, 20 respondents in file two but 15 in file three because those five respondents had 15 transactions or occasions or whatever it was now that I find quite complex to, to, to program. It is possible. Um, and indeed, I think in support not too long ago, someone asked me if I'd write that for them. I'm afraid that's not what support covers. Um, but it can be done. And it's all about what I do with those, <coughs> excuse me, what I do with those sorts of tasks is I try and write down all the permutations that can happen so that I can then write a script that deals with every scenario um, because it's easy to forget, not think of one. So I always start by mapping out on a piece of paper what could happen so that then I can start to program and make sure I catch all those scenarios. And in this particular case, I think there'd be seven actions. And then having defined those seven actions, um, I could then decide what I've got to do. So if that's greater than that and that one doesn't exist or that one doesn't, you know, I can then do something that's be action one. If this, this and this, it'll be action two. If it's this, this and this action three and sort of breaking it down into a logic flow of different things you might want to do. I find the best way of, um, you know, arriving at coming up with a solution that doesn't forget anything, which is not to say I get it right first time because I don't. Uh, they are complex, these things, when they get more complex than what I've done today. So my, 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 my suggestion is learn these techniques first if you want to do these sort of things. Learn what read next does. Learn what re-fill -E does. Learn what re rewind does. Um, all, learn all those things. Learn how to read from files and learn to store variables. Learn not how to go out the bottom of a script and use writes to write away and you're halfway to you know doing something that's really complex um, but i wouldn't pretend that reading from three or four files is easy it, it gets quite difficult is there anything else no that's it that's it all right well i'm going to close the uh, webinar there thank you very much uh, everyone for attending i hope you found it useful um, We'll be sending out a recording of this video uh, early next week and perhaps more importantly or as importantly 
all of the scripts that have been used because I think these are quite good templates um, to use in different scenarios. They might not do everything you want, but they are really good templates uh, that I think that, that, that you could build on or adjust to do different things. And I think if you can understand how all these five scripts work, you are in a very good position to do something that's even more complex. So, you know, I really do, if, if, if you think you're going to do this in the future, I would actually recommend that you have a, do some work with these while it's fresh in your mind, because some of these things are just, they're just not obvious to you if you, if you, if you haven't done it before. So I'm going to close there. Thank you for joining us. Uh, join us for the next uh, MRDCL masterclass, which I think is in five weeks time in the middle of August. So thank you for joining us and goodbye.